Welcome to part 3 of Making a Longbow. This time we fit and carve the horn knox. I've chosen cow horn as hopefully that will give us some interesting colours. Some cow horn can be as black as buffalo, but these ones look pretty colourful. I've already drilled a conical hole with a half inch opening at about one and a half inches of depth into the top and bottom knox. This larger piece of horn will form the top knock. Make sure you're putting the correct knock on the relevant limb. Before we shape the wood to fit, let's give ourselves some help by measuring out and marking the centre of the limb. A simple cross or intersecting lines will suffice. The aim is to reduce the tip of the limb so it forms a perfect cone to match the one in the horn. By keeping an eye on our markings at the end, we can keep the cone of wood as even and as straight as we can, so our knock eventually sits aligned with the rest of the bow limb. Periodically check your marking to make sure that you're keeping the cone central. The method I'm using here is to turn the bow stave with one hand and keep even strokes with the rasp in the other. Once you get close to a decent cone shape, offer up the knock and see how the fit is doing. By holding the tip of the horn and moving it, I can see and feel there is movement at the opening of the horn meaning the horn is not sitting far enough down the cone of wood, so removing wood from the tip of the cone should help. There we are, a much better fit. Not surprisingly, the process for the bottom knock is much the same. We've made our centre marking and can begin the removal of wood. Offering up the horn presents us with a puzzle. I'm unsure this time where the proud spot of wood is as the movement is less pronounced. A handy hint is to push and twist the horn onto the bow to leave a mark where to remove wood. Now we have a nice fit on both knocks, it's time to get them glued on. We use and recommend a two-part epoxy. Spread the glue evenly onto the cone and into the socket of the horn. Using a pointed piece of wood helps you get the glue down into the end of the hole. Once you're happy with the amount of glue applied, offer up the horn to the bow. Using a similar method mentioned earlier, push and twist the horn with one hand whilst holding and twisting the bow with the other. Eventually you will get out all the air bubbles that are trying to pop the horn off the end of the bow. Before the glue sets, and we're using a rapid setting version of the two-part epoxy here, make sure the knock is on straight by putting the stave onto your shoulder and looking down the length of the bow at the knock. Make sure the knock tip is pointed towards the back of the bow. When leaving the glue to set overnight, make sure you place the bow with the knocks pointed down or you'll find that they twist round as the glue sets. By the magic of editing, you join me the next day when the glue has had 24 hours to completely cure. I'm using a small bandsaw to help speed up the process of removing excess horn. You can do this by hand or any method you wish. Be careful as one slip could go down to the wood. If you're unconfident, stick to the hand rasping I'm about to show you.
With the bow safely clamped to the bench, I can use both hands on the rasp for extra control as I start to shape the horn. The more control you have, the less likely you are to cut into the wood of the stave below the knock we just glued on, or indeed cut too deeply into the horn and into the cone we shaped underneath. As you have probably gathered, as we are only 6 minutes into a 30 minute video, horn knocks are a huge amount of work. This is partly because we are making a Victorian longbow, and their bows had elaborately carved knocks. Also, there are several very important aspects and functions of the horn knocks that amateur bowyers often neglect. Hopefully, after watching this video, you will understand a great deal more about the art and the function of longbow knocks. As you may be able to see, I've moved over to using a half round rasp to carve out the main dipped central section of our knock. It's a much narrower tool and allows for greater control of the finer work we're doing now that most of the thickness of the horn has gone. Whatever shape or style you go for, keep it in mind as you work on the horn. A good mental picture will help guide you. Also, bear in mind we're trying to get the knock to align to the rest of the bow once braced and drawn. Make sure you leave your horn oversized before putting in the grooves for the string. That way, once braced, you'll have plenty of horn to remove from one side or the other to make it straight with the bow limbs. The shaping process is much the same for the bottom knock. Again following on from the Victorian pattern, the bottom knock is a smaller and shorter knock as it's likely to take more abuse, being lent on the ground as archers stand around talking to each other between ends. It still has the curved shape to allow for a stringer, but without the need for a second groove. Now we've got the basic knock shape, we can brace the bow and work on finalising any alignment issues, taking some horn off one side or the other to make sure that they're nice and straight. We're going to put some initial grooves into the knock, about an inch up from the socket end at the high point that I've left, before the shape drops into the dip of the bracing area. I'm using a rat tail rasp to make a small initial groove. I won't do a fully shaped groove until I've braced up the bow and seen where the string wants to lie. The groove I have made will be enough to hold the bow braced so we can mark the string position. 
As you can see, our dipped shape will allow for easy bracing with a simple bracing cord without resorting to an unnecessary second groove. Tie the knot of the bracing cord correctly and it will sit against the bulbous part of the knock and won't slip down to displace the bowstring from its groove. The bracing method consists of placing your foot onto the bracing cord and one hand on the handle with the belly of the bow facing down. Now carefully stand to a near upright position to bend the bow. With your spare hand reach out along the top limb to slip the loop into the knock groove. To unbrace simply pull up on the bow and remove the loop. With our bow braced we can get a better look at how it sits on the limbs allowing us to make adjustments. But let's finish our grooves first. Get a pencil and mark where the string wants to lie. Not forgetting that the bottom knock string position will look very different to the top. With our pencil lines for guidance we can start making our final string grooves. Again I'm starting with the rat tail rasp, a tool we hope to have in our catalogue soon. I can't stress enough how much care you should take at this point. Slipping with a sharp tool this near to the wooden part of the bow can cause some problems. You also don't want to get the grooves wrong as you'll have very little room on the nearly finished knocks to make up for any mistakes. The majority of the work here is to follow the pencil lines, but ultimately I want a nice rounded groove, deep enough for the string not to pop out during use and for the string to sit in its natural position once braced. After the initial cut with the rasp, it's time to widen that groove with a round file, making it a more suitable size to accommodate the style of laid-in loop that we use. The file will also smooth out the area so as not to damage the string. The method of cutting the groove doesn't change for the bottom knock, but the overall shape of the groove does, as the bottom knock has to accommodate the bowyer's knot. This goes full circle around the knock, so our groove will meet up at the back to form one looped groove.
Our final grooves are complete. We can now work on finishing the shaping and carving of the knocks. I'm starting with a flat rasp again to even up the sides, now that I can see where the knock is sitting after bracing. I may occasionally re-brace the bow to keep a check on the alignment as I go. A design and function of the top knock that I often see people getting wrong is the socket section. The even continuation from the bow limb into the horn, particularly running from the back of the bow as this is where the string needs to slide effortlessly along when bracing to get that loop into the groove. Make the change from bow into knock as seamless as possible.
that's pretty much the shape of the top knock finished. I'm also happy with the bottom knock, its robust shape and some nice colours have come through. Next I'm going to sand off the sharp edges of the grooves. As the string is going to do a fair bit of moving around, you'll need to get rid of anything that could damage it over time. Once I'm done with the sanding, I can move over to using the cabinet scraper. The grain of the horn, so to speak, can go in many directions, so you'll need to try many methods to get the best results. You should start to see an almost see-through opaqueness of the horn and its colours at this point. It's usually down to luck as to how the cow horn will come out. Sometimes you get wonderful patterns and mixes of colours, sometimes just plain black. I'm quite pleased with this one. I've got the fade out between the wood and the horn almost seamless. Thanks for watching this video. Please give us a like and subscribe if you're into this sort of thing. This has taken several weeks of my life to put together, so if you want more of these sorts of videos, please check out our donation button below and in the comments. See you next time for part four of Making a Longbow.